Good morning, saints. You know, the Bible that we hold in our hands claims to be the inspired Word of God. It tells us that it came into existence by the power of the Holy Spirit, who spoke the truth of God through men, providing instruction from God that I'm not working providing instruction from God that when appropriated to our lives will equip us, establish us, and enable us to function as man the way God intended man to function. Wonderful. And so we read a passage like Jeremiah 31 that says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. We say, oh, Father, thank you for your word it tells us that we're loved, and, and that's a great foundation to tackle life with, that no matter what we do, where we go, we are constantly and perpetually loved. Oh, how I love your Bible. Read a passage like Ephesians 4, where it says, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. We look at that and we say, well, of course, we want to forgive others. We don't want to let bitterness poison our lives. Thank you for that truth. And then you look at the second half of that, you have been forgiven. So we're already forgiven of everything that we're ever going to do before we ever even do it. Oh, Father, your word is just so incredible. I just love your Bible. How about Philippians 4? Set your mind on whatever is true, lovely, holy, honorable, just, pure, that you may experience the peace of God. Isn't that wonderful? We have the ability to set our minds so that we can experience peace in a world that's often not so full of peace. Wonderful. Father, your Bible is just so precious. And then we read a passage like Luke 12. You know, if you fail to believe, you're going to be cast out of the kingdom and there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, I, I don't believe that. And you say, what happened? I mean, is it the word of God or isn't it? And do our personal preferences, likes, and dislikes determine what parts of God's word is true and what parts of God's word are not for our modern church? Are we the ultimate determiner of, of truth? You say, why do you say this? Well, because today... We're coming to one of those passages that you just might not like very much. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And it's going to be talking about the role of men and women in corporate worship. Isn't that exciting? So even though it's one of those passages, God still wrote it, so I'm still going to invite you to stand. And let's read it together. Notice the first two words, I will. If you've been with us in our study of 1 Timothy, that's a strange word because up to now it's been, I beseech you, I beg you, I urge you. But when it comes to this context, there's a will involved, a commanding. So I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner, and the idea is I will also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with godly fear and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but that which becometh a woman professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. O oh, joy. And I permit not a woman to teach you usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. That's going to be fun. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Sounds like it's her fault. And notwithstanding, she will be saved in childbearing. Hmm. If they continue in faith and love and holiness with sobriety. Father, thank you for the time of worship we had today as we dismissed to go home. We... <laughs> Father, we look forward to seeing what you're saying here. And for your clarification as led by the Holy Spirit, that we might arrive at the truth which sets us free and not 
walk any longer in lie. So you be our teacher, and we'll trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, my friends, I've been in ministry since 1981, which is 36 years. And over the years, I've had a lot of opportunity to work with churches, other churches besides our own. Churches that are brand new, churches that are new to the economy of grace, and I've had the opportunity of watching them appropriate truth as I walk them through the various truths of the New Testament until it comes to this issue of the role of women. And when I explain that in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, women were not to be in authoritative leadership, front lines warfare, and why... I've heard responses like this. Well, we know better today in our modern world. Or, you know what, Frank? We know the Bible says that, but we like it this way. It works for us. And my friends, what we like and what works is and never has been what we are to function as when it comes to doctrinal and understanding and methodology for the church. What Father says are to be our marching orders. And so when I've affirmed what Father says regarding the role of men and women, I've heard things like this. Well, Frank, those were cultural norms for that time period. They're not true for today. The bottom line is that men and women both find 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15 unpalatable. I have a personal conviction about that. I believe if Father wrote these words, then they are good words. They just need to be understood. We need to make sure that they're saying what they say, and we also need to make sure that they're not saying what we think they say and not read into them. So let me just share with you that we're not going to be spending much time in the text today. Instead, what's the number one rule of interpreting the Bible? Context. So today, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the historical context of men and women in the Jew and Gentile world at the time these books were written. And we're going to be looking at the biblical record, which tells us how men and women were created and how they violated how they were created and how that has continued to this day and hopefully correct some of the misunderstanding and lay a platform by which we'll be able to come to this passage next week and it will just unfold open for us with great understanding and we'll see the beauty of what Father is really saying because let's be honest, when we read it at face value, it sounds very oppressive and suppressive and demeaning of women. So let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. Turn in your Bible, if you would, to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. We know that God created man in Genesis 2. Ish is the word. The Hebrew word for man, ish, I-S-H. It means my Lord. Out of all the creation that God created, only one was created in the imago dei, the image of God. He was the image bearer of who God is to the visible physical world, what an invisible God was like. Wonderful. But he was alone, and that was not so wonderful. So God created Isha, Hebrew word, my lady. A derivative word out of Ish, for she was a derivative person, created out of Adam, whereas Adam was created out of the dust, and created out of man for man, according to 1 Corinthians 11, to be a very special helpmate. So own the language. God didn't create a man and a woman. That's English. He created Ish and Isha, my Lord, my lady. The very terms connote to us respect, honor, dignity, Majesty. For who? Both of them. 
Mankind, male and female, created he them. Ish and Isha, the royal children of the king of kings, the prince and the princess of creation, the ones who, according to Psalm 8, were created by God to be co-rulers with God over this physical world that he had created, the vice regents, if you will, of creation. Wonderful. Now they had roles. The roles are there in Ephesians 5. And as soon as I say Ephesians chapter 5, many of you who've been oppressed and suppressed and lied to are already starting to tune me out because you know what's coming, don't you? Ephesians 5, 22. Women, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Submit, 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 submit. You've heard it, haven't you? Which is strange to me because there's two to three times as many verses dealing with the guy. Lover, lover, lover being willing to die for her. And we fail to even, when we teach those passages, pastors fail to point out that the roles in there both come out of Ephesians 5.21, which is submit yourselves one to another. 22 through 29 and 30, 31, the rest of the chapter is just an explaining of what that looks like. We ought to do the marriage ceremony that way. Do you covenant to submit to each other? And here's how you do it. Husband, you love her enough to die for her. Oh, I'd be willing to take a bullet, but I'd treat her like crap for the rest of the week. <laughs> it's not talking about taking a bullet. It's talking about dying to your own life needs and desires to do what is best for her and be willing to do that. That's what love is. Love does what is best for another. And what is she doing? She honors him. She's the adored one. She expresses love, honor to the man doing what's best for him. And so you get two people doing the best they can for each other. And what happens when it's fulfilled is that love is so fully demonstrated that an outsider to the relationship doesn't see the roles. My heart commitment is that when Janet and I walk into this room, there's not a person in this room that would look and say, well, there goes the head of the relationship and the one who submits. What I want is when they walk in to say, my, look at how they love each other. And nobody sees the roles. Does it make sense? That's Ish and Isha. And all Ephesians 5 is, is a telling of what that looked like in the book of Genesis. Glory. My Lord and my lady have entered the room. This is how God set it up. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And what happened? The happy couple become the unhappy couple because they failed to function in their roles. Follow through chapter 3 of Genesis. The tempter came to Eve alone. What was she doing alone? We don't know. But what should she have done as soon as that tempter said, you know, God's holding out on you. That tree's really good to eat. And you know what? You shall surely not die. Instantly, what should she have done? She should have run to Adam, her relational protection. Instead, she functioned in independence and got deceived. And then she made matters worse by stepping into a role of leadership, goes to her husband, says, look, I didn't die and the food is good. You should eat. And like a dolt, what did he do? <laughs> he should have run to God with their newfound problem. Father, I have a problem. This beautiful Isha that you gave to me has stumbled. Is there anything we can do? And we would have been reading a different Bible and experiencing a different life. He should have run to his relational protection, but instead he followed her lead and he functioned in rebellion and through his willful disobedience, Adam, not Eve, plunged the world into sin and separation from God. 
And there has been confusion and perversion and rebellion ever since against God's ordained design. And so do you know what we have throughout history? We have the abuse of women. Century after century after century, women have been degraded and suppressed and made fun of and cast down and put down. And do you know what we have right alongside it? The abusive women. Women who rise up against that in a way that they should not. And they end up degrading and demeaning and suppressing the male side of the race. So let's look at the first one. The abuse of women. Women have been spiritually abused, suppressed, and oppressed, and a lot of it's been done in the name of God. If you look at 1 Timothy 2.14, that verse has been quoted. After all, it was the woman who was in the transgression. It's her fault. If you really understand your Bible, it wasn't Eve that plunged the world into sin. It didn't say in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Eve all died. It says in Adam. Now, the historical context, there's only two kinds of people in the world back then when the Bible was written, and that's Jews and Gentiles. The Jews had their religion, if you will, and then the Gentiles had all their, what was called the mystery religions. Let's look at what it was like to be a, a Jewess. In Judaism, a woman was considered not a person, but a possession. One ancient rabbi said, to instruct a woman is to cast pearls before swine. Women were not allowed in the synagogue in worship. They were kept in a side room where they couldn't be seen. It was forbidden for a woman to teach in a school. The daily prayer of a Jewish man was this. Now ponder this. Getting up in the morning, doing your stretching, pull the covers off, step your feet out onto the floor, raise your hands to God and say, Oh, Lord, I thank you that I was not made a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. What do you think the wife who overheard that prayer felt like? Rabbi Joseph ben Yohanan said this, talk not much with a woman. Everyone that talks much with a woman causes evil to himself and desists from the works of the law, and his end is that he inherits Gehenna. A strict rabbi would never greet a woman on the street, not even his own wife, daughter, sister, or mother. He would not make eye contact with her. Can you imagine being the mama of this rabbi? You carried this boy in your belly. You struggled to give him life. And on the street, he won't even look you in the eye. You give him life. You don't get any respect or honor in return in the public arena. One rabbi said this, her work is to send her children to the synagogue to attend to domestic concerns, to leave her husband free to study in the schools, to keep house for him until he returns. It was not a great thing to be a Jewess. Well, what about the Gentile world? But well, for women, it was twofold. On the one hand, and on the one extreme, women were used as priestesses in the sexual mystery religions, prostitutes in sexual worship. It shouldn't surprise us. Men have been using women in that arena for centuries. Respectable women, on the other hand, lived a confined life. They had their own quarters in which no one but their husband came. She was not allowed to appear at meals. She never appeared at any time on the street alone. She never went to any public assembly. So a Gentile woman in the culture in which the Bible was written was either a sexual play toy or a domestic servant provided with room and board for having and raising a man's children. I trust you know that wherever you have suppression, you are going to have rebellion. Because the human spirit was not designed for bondage. It was designed for freedom. Freedom! You remember William Wallace? 
men will die for freedom. Now, freedom doesn't mean doing whatever you want to do, which is what happens many times when we do rebel because the pendulum never seems to stop in the middle. It goes to the other extreme. Freedom is being what you were designed to be. Freedom is functioning as God intended you to function as an experiencer and expressor of the life of God within your distinct and unique creation as a male or female child of God. But it doesn't happen. Because we've got this thing called male domination, which is something man was never designed to do. He was designed to honor her, to esteem her, to shepherd her, to love her, to guide her if she would follow. But he can't make her follow. So he falls into domination, and whenever there's domination, there's going to be a female liberation, which again was something women was never designed to do. And so let's look at the second one, what we could call the abusive women. We've had the abuse of women for centuries, and in return, we've had abuse of women. Please understand, the modern feminist movement is nothing new. It's been around since men fell in the garden. Ancient feminist movements were in Corinth. We studied that book a couple of years ago. We saw that women were dressing like men. They were having men's haircuts. Uh, they were hunting bare-breasted as the thing to do in, in ancient Corinth. They were disrupting the public assembly, calling attention to themselves, arguing and fighting with men in the public worship. At Ephesus, it was no different, apparently, from the pastorals. Women were dressing indiscreetly, leading contentious and disruptive lives, calling attention to themselves. Second Timothy 3 says they were laden with sin, and filled with lust, listening to traitors, i.e. false teachers. First Timothy 5, they were living in pleasure, living in idleness, tail bearers, and busybodies. And what was happening? Where were the men? Well, look at First Timothy 2. What does it say? It says, play the role of lead. Stop acting like such a sissy. First, one of the shortest verses in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 16, act like a man. You were designed in the image of God to be a warrior. You were designed to be a soldier. You were designed to defend, to lay down your life. Why is most church work done by women? Why do men have to be exhorted to take the lead? It should come naturally. Rise up, O oh men of God, the old hymn writer said. It's weird. In the same context, he says there that men are contentious, divisive, and causing division. Why is that? Because men don't lead at home, so they've got to find somewhere to lead, and usually it's by being a pain in the backside of the church when they're put in leadership. Because they're going to find a place to be a man somewhere. And throughout history, this is what's been happening. Yeah, outside the church, inside the church, there is male oppression of women. There is women rebellion against that male oppression. And there are men failing to fulfill their role of honor and respect and the failure of men to fulfill their role of loving and protecting shepherd. Happens all over the world. I would make three observations to that, my friends. One, and very important, we better grab it, there is an ongoing satanic plot to get mankind to abandon their God-ordained roles. That is what he was about in the Garden of Eden. He was trying to des destroy that original family. Why? Because family is the supreme entity through whom God works to establish the faith and pass it on to the next generation. And have you seen the Hollywood agenda? Because it's anti that. I've, I've been watching. I watch TV sometimes. I watch the, the movies. And you know what the, the new thing in Hollywood is? To portray the woman as the great warrior, the great new detective, the great new cop, the great frontline army man. You with me? You seeing it? And man, you just become the little wuss that you are. Secondly, there is an almost universally held belief system that women are in their essence usurpers and controllers. Royal, which I can't say in church or I'll get in trouble at home. And men in response to that are either 
despotic or they're dupes. And most of the fodder coming out of Hollywood today is that the man is a dupe that has to be led around the nose by a strong woman. And thirdly, there are far too many people in the church but believe those above perversions were part of the curse of Genesis chapter 3. And that's what I want to go after today. Say, Frank, what are you talking about? If you are a, you've been in church at all over the years, I have little doubt that you have heard what we're about to proclaim to you taught in church. It's, it's, it's out there, and it's out there in a very big way. Let's walk our way through Genesis chapter 3. We know that from verse 16, because of the sin of Eve, this is what they teach. Women were cursed by God with two things. Pain in childbirth, and look at the second half of verse 16. He says, and your desire will be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. So let's follow the flow of thought. We have woman who's deceived, and she leads her husband into sin. Man follows the lead of his bride and willfully sins against God. At that point, both men and women hide from God because fear has entered into humanity. You know, that may be one of the things that I regret most when I read these pages. Is that we now have to fear. We don't have to, but we do. And fear is such a crippler. Do you realize men and women up to the point of that sin never, ever had fear? How many of you struggle with fear? Fear is brutal. Fear will paralyze you. Fear will destroy you. And you know what's sad about a lot of it? It's all imagined. Most of what we fear never comes to pass. But it's potential. So God comes to Adam, hiding in the bushes, and says, what have you done? Have you eaten from the forbidden tree? And what does our brave warrior do? Well, the woman, he blames her. He should have come to her defense. That serpent beguiled her. What are we going to do, God? But that's not the way we function as humanity. Whenever a finger is pointed at us, the very easiest thing to do is point it right back at somebody else. And then he blamed God. You know, it's ultimately your fault. You're the one who gave her to me. If you hadn't given her to me, we hadn't, wouldn't be having this discussion right now. So God turns to Eve. What have you done? And what does she do? She blames the serpent. And the blame game has begun and functioned well ever since. So in response, what does God do? Now watch the progression. This is very, very interesting. He starts in verse 14 with the serpent, and he gives him two curses. He says, cursed are you, serpent. Own that word cursed. Very important today. On your belly you shall go, and the consequence is that you're going to be eating dust. And two, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed. And here's the glory. Woman, this is not the end of the story. Your seed is coming. And when it does, it's going to crush that serpent's head. So you may have done something you ought not to have done, but watch what I'm going to do through what you've done. I'm still going to use you in an incredible way to bring restoration back to the realm of humanity. This is your God. This is the very first all things work together for good in Scripture. Then they say, verse 16, God puts two curses on the woman. He says, your pain is going to be multiplied in childbirth. And two, this is what they say, you're going to have a sinful desire for your husband. 
What does that mean? Well, we just do interpretation. We do what's called the analogy of Scripture. And if you just go over a few verses to Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, we're going to see that word desire used again. Look at it in Genesis 4, 7. This is the sin of Cain when he doesn't bring the proper offering and he is not happy about his offering not being accepted when his brother Abel's sacrifice is accepted. So God tells Cain in verse 7, Cain, if you just do what's right, it'll be accepted. But if you don't do well, watch the language, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you and you must rule over him. So sin is waiting, crouching like a wild animal, trying to devour you and master you. Commentator Leupold writes this, sin is likened to a wild beast crouching at the door. As promptly as a beast would seize a man going out the door, sin will leap upon one and hurt him, striving to get at him. This is not a mild, passing, tame leopard or harmless pet. It is thirsting for your blood, end quote. So you better rule over sin because sin's wanting to rule over you. With me? So we take that interpretation, put it right in 4.7, in 3.16, and it's, he's basically saying this, in the same way, the woman's going to try to rule over you, O oh man, so you have to rule over her instead. What a great way to start a marriage. Can you imagine doing that in a wedding ceremony? Now, okay, O oh man, I need to let you in on this. She's going to try to control you and manipulate you for the rest of your life, so you got to control her so she doesn't manipulate and control you. Have a happy marriage. Well, you know, there's proof that this is the correct interpretation. I mean, look at all the women's lib movements. And let's be honest, women are always trying to control men. Aren't all men trying to control other men? You know, I, I shared this with you before. I had a person come to me years ago, Frank Friedman, you're a controller. That's the difference between the two of us is I admit it. You won't admit it, and that's why we're having such a problem. And isn't it true that the supreme element of the flesh that we all have is that the flesh is a controller? We all want to control. That comes from believing the lie that we shall be like God and God is in control. So we think we got to be in control. It's one of those things we have to repent of. Why would Father stress the woman and not the man? And my ultimate question is this. Would God really curse his daughter with a desire to rebel? But this is what they teach. Then they go into verse 17, God curses the ground with thorns and thistles, one curse. And then God curses the man that he's going to have to work now with labor and sweat and not experience the rest of God anymore. And if you look at that in its context, then you naturally have to question, why did the woman get two curses when the man in the ground only got one? That doesn't seem fair. And let's get real did your biblical observation, didn't you? The word curse is not mentioned when it talks of the woman, and the word curse is not mentioned when he talks about the man. And why is that? Because God does not curse his kids, ever. What's wrong with the rest of you? That was about 10. God cursed the serpent, God cursed the ground, but nowhere in the context did he curse the man or the woman. What he did with the man and the woman is he disciplined them. He gave them perpetual reminders of how hard life is going to be when you choose your way instead of God's way. That's what that's about. So every time that woman had that child, she's getting a reminder, do it God's way. Every day that a man goes out and has to labor and sweat when he used to just labor without the sweat, it's a daily reminder, do it God's way. When you do it your way, it's going to be true of you what God said to Saul, it is hard to kick against the goad. There's no curse on the woman at all. 
Now, let's be honest. We got to be correct when we look at this and, and, and fair. Context is very important. Yes, it is. Lexicography is very important. Yes, it is. And when you look at Genesis 3.16 and you look at Genesis 4.7, those two verses are very close together. It's the same author, Moses, who's using the word desire. And normally we would say desire, if, since it's in 4.7, means rule, then it must mean that in 3.16. But not necessarily because there are other rules of hermeneutics. One of those rules is this. We never use an obscure verse to help us interpret or support another verse. We use a very clear verse as a support verse. Make sense? You wouldn't use an obscure verse as a proof text. Say, why are you saying that? Because the commentator Proch says Genesis 4-7 is the most difficult verse in the chapter and may be the most difficult verse in the book of Genesis. I have read some commentators who think Genesis 4-7 is the most difficult verse in the entire Bible because of the grammar and the verb choices, which I won't go into. One author commenting on Genesis 4-7 said this, every attempt to extract the meaning from this verse is more or less a tour de force. Bottom line, Genesis 4-7 is a difficult verse and should not be used as a proof text for what appears to be a difficult verse in itself, Genesis 3-16. So we now have questions. And this is our first question. What then is Genesis 3-16 really saying when it says your desire will be for him and he will rule over you? What does it really mean? If it doesn't mean this, oppression, suppression, put down, control, then what does it mean? And we also would ask then, is there a clear verse somewhere in the Bible that would help us understand what this word desire really means? And I think in answer to that question, we say, yes, there is such a verse, and it's in Song of Solomon chapter 7, where Shulamith, you remember Song of Solomon? We studied it a couple years ago. Highest attendance we ever had at Grace Life. Sex sells even in the church. Shulamith, the bride, deeply in love with Solomon, her husband, makes this declaration of love. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. His healthy, devoted, Sexually expressive, loving desire is for me, no other. Desire in that context, then, is the healthy, beautiful sexual desire in a marriage relationship. And I will ask this question. What would happen to Genesis 3.16 if we interpret it not as the desire to usurp or master or control, but instead as the normal, beautiful, healthy sexual desire of a woman for her husband? Let's follow the flow of thought in Genesis, interpreting it that way. But before we do, I want to put something in your brain. I want to put a reminder of the heart of God towards his kids who fail. Uh, is that anybody here in this room? Hear his heart for you. I'm going to say it again. Hear his heart for you. Remember John 21. What's John 21? Peter is commissioning to lead and feed God's sheep. Three times Peter has denied his Lord. What does Jesus do in response? He gives him a threefold reminder of his failure. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you like me at least? That was very hard for Peter to hear, was it not? It always hurts to be reminded of your failure. But Jesus didn't do it to be mean. He did it for the purpose of building him up. Because every time Peter said, oh, Lord, I do love you, Jesus said what? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. 
Hear the language that I'm going to say right now and put on that screen up there for you to see. In spite of what you have done, nothing has changed in the eyes of God. You are still his child. Own the heart and mind of God towards his kids. Let these words reverberate in your mind as we go to Genesis 3. In spite of what you've done, nothing has changed. You're still my guy. And in this case, in Genesis 3, you're still my girl. In Genesis chapter 3, follow the flow of thought, we've got the woman caught alone, and she succumbs to deception. She then assumes the role of leading Adam, and Adam chooses to follow Eve. You know, God, if you hadn't made her so pretty, this would have been easier. But she is so pretty. And how can I say no to her? I'll say no to you instead. And he willfully disobeys, plunging man into sin and death. God confronts the man and the woman, and this brave warrior says it's all her fault. And then God says, by the way, sweetheart, now you're going to get pain in childbirth. And this is so bad that women die sometimes in childbirth, and that includes our modern world, gang. Even with all of our modern medicine, sometimes women die. Janet came close with number three. She got that eclampsia. Blood pressure, 210 over 150. We had to put her in the ICU. And now a few days later, follow the scenario. Here he comes. He's got that little gleam in his eye. And he's walking cute. And he says, hey, baby, you want to make love? May I play the part of Eve for just a minute? Are you kidding me? You just blame me for everything that's happened and now you want to do what and bring me near to the doorstep of death? Are you out of your mind? How'd I do? You hear the words of John 21? You're still my kids. Nothing's changed. Oh, Isha, my lady, you made a very bad choice, sweetheart. And Ish, my lord, you made a worse choice. And Isha, you're going to have to suffer some very painful reminders. And baby, I understand he was a real jerk. But you're still my girl. And he's still my boy. And nothing has changed. In spite of that pain, you're still going to love him. And desire him sexually. And he's still going to be your protection. Relationally. You see Genesis 3. Far from being a curse my friends. It's actually a reaffirmation. Of the masculine and feminine roles. That they had just failed to maintain. And perverted. This. Is our God. He's a restorer. He's not a curser. So when we come to a passage like 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, and it looks harsh, and it looks suppressive, and it looks demeaning, I permit not a woman to teach, I permit not a woman to have authority over a man, we need to, when we come to it, affirm that it is good 
We're going to have to study it in light of the inherent belief that it is good so that we can arrive at the correct and appropriate interpretation so that we can then appropriate its inherent goodness so that we can live in the proper and powerful reality of our roles before God. And we're going to do that next week. Father, we all make such stupid choices all the time. And the accuser is always there to slander us, to question the validity of who we are. I know practically everyone in this room hears those words. How could you be a child of God and just do what you did? Father, your children who fail sometimes needed to hear what we see in Genesis today. That you will even work sin for your good. Out of Eve's failure, Eve will now become the vehicle through whom the seed of God shall enter into the realm of humanity and crush the serpent's head. And though this man plays the part of the coward, you instill him with honor. And you put desire in Eve for her to love this man in spite of what he did. And from the very beginning page of failure comes instantly restoration. You boggle our minds, Lord. I don't like to be one who ministers shame. The enemy does enough of that. But shame on those people who teach this is cursing a woman. Shame on them, Lord. Is not who you are. I pray that the saints in this assembly will claim how much you love them, how much you've forgiven them, how much you have restored them, that we might live in our role powerfully, honoring each other in such a way so powerfully, so gloriously that the roles just disappear in the expression of love. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.